war against Ukraine has spotlighted the geopolitics of fossil fuel dependence. The energy transition towards renewables and green hydrogen offers an opportunity to reduce dependence on unreliable or volatile suppliers. It simultaneously creates new interdependencies and power relations. In this panel, we want to look at the two sets of risks, those posed by climate change itself and those sparked by the shifting geopolitics of energy. And welcome back, everybody. Great to have you with us for this session on the impact of the Energiewende on peace and security. And uh, as uh, we just heard in our short film there, indeed, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has spotlighted the urgency of overcoming dependence on fossil fuels as never before. So in the next hour, we want to take a deeper dive on the shifting geopolitics of energy, asking whether the energy vendor stabilizes global energy, energy systems and reduces geopolitical risks, or whether it could create new interdependencies, and we just touched on that in our Green Sofa debate with the heads of IEA and IRENA, or whether it will create new interdependencies that could wind up outweighing the benefits of cutting back on fossil fuels. Those are a couple of the questions that we'll address with an outstanding panel. We are waiting for one member of the panel, but I'm just going to go ahead and introduce our other panelists and then also do a brief audience poll, uh, hopefully buying a little bit of time for our fourth panelist uh, to get here. So it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Roberto Ching. Golani. He is Italy's Minister of Economic Ecologic Transition, and he previously served as Scientific Director of the Italian Institute of Technology, an an internationally esteemed research center and was also chief technology and innovation officer of the Italian aerospace company Leonardo. Great to have you with us, Minister. And uh, we are also very pleased to welcome with us, joining us remotely, Adam Guibourget Chepvertinsky. I hope I more or less correctly pronounced that, dear Under Secretary of State. He is Under Secretary in the Ministry of Climate and Environment of Poland, and he was the former Chief Negotiator of the Polish Presidency of COP24 in Katowice, after which he headed the Environmental Department at the Permanent Representative of the Republic of Poland to the the EU. And it's uh, also a great pleasure to welcome a, a woman who was mentioned uh, with great enthusiasm in our opening ceremony, Jennifer Morgan. She was recently appointed State Secretary and Special Envoy for International Climate Action at Germany's Federal Foreign Office. She is a former member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and she will be familiar to many of you also as the former Executive Director of Greenpeace International. It's great to see you again, Jennifer, and wonderful to have you on this panel. As I said, we're waiting for a fourth panelist. I will introduce him when he arrives. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do while we're waiting for his arrival is a very brief uh, survey of the audience. Again, this is one that you can take part in either at hashtag BETD2022 or by using our digital tool. You see the question hopefully right now on your screen. It is this. From a security perspective, how would you judge the Energiewende? It will make the world safer. It will make the world less safe. Or the effects will cancel each other out. And I'm going to give you a little time to vote. At the moment, it's 100% going in one direction. But we'll see if that could change. And yeah, you're staying at 100%. But we're going to take another look at that in just a moment. Maybe, though, what I'll do is I will get the take from those of who are with us now on how you see exactly that question, whether you think that the current crisis will accelerate the shift out of fossil fuels and into green energy, and that that will make the global energy system more stable, or that we're going to be replacing one set of vulnerabilities with another one. Professor Ching uh, Minister Cingolani. It's okay. Thank you. Well, um, the present crisis, uh, to my opinion, uh, will accelerate the transformation. Uh, first of all, I, I would have answered the question, will make the world cleaner, not safer. 
I don't think uh, safety will depend primarily on energy. It will depend on the attitude and behavior of humans. So it will be cleaner, the world. Uh, the, 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 the situation we are facing now uh, is, of course, forcing all countries to accelerate uh, in, towards uh, uh, renewable energies. Um, we, I mean, for instance, in Italy, we are trying to keep the, the roadmap to minus 55% uh, decarbonization uh, exactly as it was before the war in that we are replacing, we will replace the gas that is currently imported by Russia in exactly the same amount or possibly slightly less because in the meantime, we're accelerating uh, renewable installations. We are accelerating the uh, energy saving program. Uh, so in, let's say in a few years, uh, hoping the war will finish as soon as possible, in a few years, we will have more renewable electricity, slightly less gas, but I think the real challenge is not 2030. The roadmap up to there is clear. The real challenge is after 2030. And I think we need a completely different uh, energy landscape for the second and third decade. Uh, right now, I don't think uh, energy intensive countries such as Germany or Italy can make it only with renewable and having a, a little amount of gas for programmability. So this requires some deep thought. Thank you very much. And State Secretary Morgan, can I get your take on the same uh, question, if you would? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the energy transformation, the Energiewende, in the middle of this um, horrible war, um, I think it, um, it will come together and has to come together to create more stability, but it will be disruptive. I mean, we are seeing how disruptive dependency on, right now, Russian uh, fossil fuels is, and we're seeing how um, disruptive um, the dependency on all fossil fuels is through climate impacts that are happening around the world that are making us much less safe. So I think, uh, and there are a myriad of examples there that are that are front and center. So I think the um, the key, though, is right now in the short term to be accelerating that uh, transition, as both ministers spoke about this morning, into renewables and energy efficiency to be looking at, for Germany, how to fill that gap, but to fill the gap in a way that, uh, from Russian uh, oil and gas, that doesn't just mean that it gets filled at the same amount uh, from other suppliers. In other yes. words, we must uh, take that step to really remove our dependency on all fossil fuels uh, as soon as possible. Does that mean that there will be other security or stability issues that come forward? Yes. Uh, do, do we have to tackle that? Do we have to address that and figure out how to do that? We can do that, and we, we're doing a lot of work here at the Foreign Ministry to do that. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, and in fact, we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later, but let me now welcome our fourth member of the panel. It's a great pleasure to welcome Yaroslav Demchenkov. Wonderful that you can be with us. And uh, he is Ukraine's Deputy Minister of Energy. He is Ukraine's Deputy Minister of Energy and Environmental Protection, as well as Deputy Minister of Energy for European Integration in a career that has included high-level positions with the UN Development Program and the World Bank. He has long experience with international projects in energy, green economy, and infrastructure. And, sir, I'd like to, uh, I, I will ask the Polish uh, Under Secretary of State uh, if you would kindly uh, defer at the moment from answering that question we just posed, and we're going to go straight to uh, the uh, Deputy Minister uh, from Ukraine to basically get your assessment of the current security balance as it links to energy. Thank you so much. Uh, I do really appreciate to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Our country is already in the second month of Russian's invasion into Ukraine. And after five weeks of our war against, or uh, of this war against uh, originally Ukrainians, uh, uh, against humanity, freedom, and democracy, I want to stress that Putin has a specific plan to destroy Ukraine's energy infrastructure, and Putin avoid shelling around our gas 
transportation system to, U to Europe so that he has a plan after taking control over Ukraine to use our energy system to continue bargaining and trading with Europe and keep it, it hook it on the needle of energy dependence. It is an attack on the unity and future of Europe and its nations. Panic on Europe's energy market is playing a fiber role uh, of Russia because this panic fits right into Putin's very cynic and aggressive strategy. The current panic is grounded on, in a myth that Europe has no future without Russian energy sources. Russia continues to use politicians and lobbyists on its payroll to create a fear within the European community that the green transition is dead end and that now you should increase the level of fossil fuel and especially Russian gas. Europe should meet this challenge with dignity and resolve. We should ensure our energy security and not divide from planet green course. And the war and the current energy crisis should be a turning point for Europe in ending Russia's energy blackmail and achieving global decarbonization goals. I confident that this topic uh, uh, very important for all of us, and I am confident that this uh, sad and tra tra tragic uh, event uh, in our country should change the current energy security balance with the main direction. Firstly, destroyed completely the Russian myth that Europe could not survive without Russian energy. Second, stop financial floors to Russia. Russians get more profit selling fossil fuel. Uh, we should stop this. We should review plans for the use of gas as a transitional fuel, taking uh, diversification and energy security into account. And last but not the least, invest in balancing capacity, including storages, to enable more use of renewables. Commercialization of other latest grass technology is energy. In the long run, they will guarantee energy independence and efficiency contribution to the goal, uh, effectively contribution to the goal of our Paris Agreement. Thank you very much. May I just ask you a very brief follow-up question? And that would be whether, as a result of the, the war, you have a different perspective now on nuclear energy? Yeah, uh, just recently we had a meeting, uh, PTEC event, yeah, and we discussed this issue of uh, nuclear energy. You know, in this case, we see that uh, Russia uh, occupied uh, and captured the biggest in Europe uh, nuclear power plant uh, in Zaporizhia. And we see that Russia uh, really demonstrate, uh, it's easy to, it difficult to say it, uh, unfriendly, very aggressive activities, and this is act of nuclear terrorism. And we see that Russia has shown completely disregard to the key pillars that ensure the development of nuclear energy, namely safety, security, and safeguards. So that's why our society, Europe, the United States, and all countries should demonstrate Russia very active positions. And first of all, I, we, we believe that it is necessary to limit the ability of Russia to implement new projects for the construction of nuclear facilities uh, outside Russia, especially here in Europe. In spring 2020, Rosatom provided evidence of actual contracts for the complete or partial construction of just 
25 reactors, and this is a, a huge amount of uh, funds, a total volume around 100 billion US dollars. So we should stop this. We should provide sanctions uh, uh, on the whole Rosatom group. We should limit the uh, ability uh, of Russia to provide their influence, uh, Russians to provide their influence on UN agencies, such as International Atomic Agency, uh, and these agencies should be more active and uh, tell the people a really threat regarding Russia, this situation on nuclear, with nuclear facilities in our. And the, the last, dirty bomb. This is not a myth. It could be, really. This is a really big uh, threat for all Europe, Europe, for Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. And uh, we should, because of this, we should stop Putin immediately, because each hour cost for our country a fortune, not just only because destroy of infrastructure, but each hour Putin is killing our civilians, our people, children. You see a lot of refugees in your country. More refugees could be here if we not stop Putin, not just only from Ukraine. He, uh, he tried to destroy our uh, um, re revenues, uh, storages for diesel fuel, because of uh, his plan also stop agriculture activities, stop pumping in this period of time, but this is very important. If we will not do this, we will have a lot of refugees, not just only from Ukraine. We will have a lot of refugees from Africa, other countries, because they will not have enough food. Mm -hmm. This is criminal war. This is terrorist, and this is really active uh, uh, activities against humanity, against uh, civilization, against our uh, green, uh, green transition and our uh, future world. Uh, and uh, really, we are close to the uh, second, uh, third uh, world war. We should stop his immediately, him immediately. Thank you very much. And you mentioned refugees. Let's go now to uh, the European Union member state that has taken in the most refugees so far, namely Poland, under Secretary of State uh, Grzegorzze Czetwertynski is with us. Uh, sir, your uh, response also, the current security balance as it relates to energy. Well, you know, first of all, it's, it's I think, very delicate to now take the floor after Yaroslav, who, who just gave us a, a, a very pregnant te testimony of the dramatic events that are taking place currently in Ukraine. And, and it seems, it may seem a bit uh, um, uh, detached from reality to be uh, uh, talking about very long-term objectives when uh, you have uh, a nation that is uh, uh, being bombed daily, uh, that is fighting for our freedom and our democracy. And, you know, you mentioned the number of refugees that Poland is, is taking. I mean, we we are doing this and we are doing other things to, to, to support Ukraine and we're doing other, we will do everything we can to continue to support Ukraine. But I think it is really uh, uh, not much in comparison uh, with what could happen if we uh, if we don't take the, the decisive steps we need to take now to, to stop Putin, as just Jaroslav has said it. Uh, and answering to your previous questions on, on, uh, on nuclear, I think we, we shouldn't mix uh, the, the, the risk. I mean, the risk is coming from the war. The risk is coming from Putin attacking Ukraine. And it's not only a problem of this civilian infrastructure. It's a problem of many different civilian infrastructure. Uh, uh, Minister Dimchakov mentioned that also in his intervention. Uh, uh, and the use of civilian targets in a war is just criminal. And it's not something um, that uh, uh, we should accept and we should actually uh, condemn it as the, as the inter international community. Uh, um, not only uh, these infrastructures that were mentioned, I, you know, I don't want to make the, the, the list of, of the risky infrastructures uh, that we have, civilian infrastructure, uh, um, but definitely using these civilian objectives for, for war purposes is not something uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, now, coming to, to your qu question about energy security, I think in this energy transition period, we are indeed in a, in a more difficult 
uh, uh, times because, in a sense, we are combining the risks associated with the old energy system we're trying to get uh, rid of, you know, the volatility of the prices in the um, in, in, uh, on the fossil fuels, uh, the, the ge geopolitical risks uh, associated with that, and very well materialized now with the with the with the war, and and with all the risks associated with the with the, the new system at the, the the same time, the stability of the energy system, and uh, you know the connection with the weather, for instance, for renewables. So we are combining all the risks together. So in this sense, the the, the current transition is uh, is definitely. Uh, a more uh, difficult, uh, difficult challenge. But the long-term objective of um, becoming climate neutral by 2050 for the EU and uh, getting rid, therefore, of uh, fossil fuels is absolutely aligned with our new found world to get rid of Russian uh, fossil fuels as soon as possible. So I think in the long term, these objectives are perfectly well aligned. The challenge is really in the short term, how uh, do we uh, uh, find a new path that allows us to get to the same final objective of becoming climate neutral as the EU by 2050 without uh, uh, relying on uh, imports uh, from uh, from Russian fossil fuels? And that is, that is the big challenge that we are facing now. And let's uh, drill deeper now on precisely that challenge, on the timing and transition risks uh, that all of you have uh, mentioned in part. And I'd like to go back, uh, if I may, to uh, Deputy Minister Demchenkov. Your president has called for Germany to end imports of Russia, Russian fossil fuels now. As we know, Minister Habeck has been working tirelessly to bring them down. He's already got natural gas. Uh, down from a 55% share of Germany's uh, overall natural gas imports to 40. That's in five weeks, uh, so that's quite astonishing. But how can we accomplish such a major shift short term? We are advocating the smart approach that should not harm the European energy security, but at the same time can be harmful for Russian energy policy and significant limits uh, their possibility to manipulate uh, uh, manipulate the markets first of all and for instance Europe can easily refuse from Russian LNG that will not have a great impact on their EU economy because it is only 9% of consumption, but it will give a powerful signal to Russians and to markets and will have a significant sociology effect, effect for society. And that's, uh, this task may not sound uh, visible, but it is. Con Concluding uh, the, uh, uh, the the trans transit uh, contract with uh, Rosatom, for example, forcing Russia to complete with the third energy package or stopping Nord Stream 2 didn't sound real either. But uh, we see that in the end, none of us believe also that the war against a sovereign European country in the 21st century was real, but did we? And uh, we can't understand uh, the arguments you may hear, including uh, 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 reluctance or fear on an exact. <coughs> so uh, we see a lot of messages everywhere that uh, it is quite difficult for us uh, not to use uh, Russian uh, uh, Russian energy, not to use. But uh, we see a lot of opportunities. For example, uh, our country can propose uh, uh, storages, gas storages. So we could uh, have a lot of cooperation in this field. Sometimes. Uh, some, some types of uh, fuel are easily replaceable now, and we should take this into account. And we see that some European business st even now stop using Russians' uh, uh, fossil fuels, uh, such as uh, 
coal, oil, LNG, and other. And this is a good message for governments to do the same. And we are waiting from our European partners that they will stop use uh, Russian uh, fossil fuels. And uh, this is this is very important message. And uh, I would like just only to use this opportunity to pay more attention on the future. Uh, we. Uh, should pay more attention on green hydrogen and uh, green technology and use them <coughs> as soon as uh, possible and also implement energy efficiency. This is also a very uh, important approach because uh, we could reduce the consumption of gas and oil uh, and uh, definitely this uh, could give a, a significant message to markets, uh, really uh, relocated uh, their, their approach and to have different approaches. Thank you very much. And let me go to Germany and uh, then to Italy to talk a little bit about diversification, because in fact, your two countries are more dependent on Russian gas than many other EU member states. As I mentioned, you're both working toward diversification uh, short term. What are your main priorities and what trade-offs can and must you make? And I'm referring in part to the debate that we saw as Minister Habeck went to Qatar and UAE and uh, questions were raised about whether we're just shifting one potentially politically problematic source of supply for another. Well, I think first of all, our, our top priority is to stop the war and find ways as quickly as possible in an emergency way to, to have peace. And to do that in every single way that we can, um, I'll come to the energy question, but also obviously to support you and your incredibly, incredible country people in what you're going through. Uh, and to help who, all of the Ukrainians who come here, I agree with my colleague from Poland, it's, it's a small thing for us to do knowing what you are going through right now. Um, obviously, this is an incredibly challenging situation, um, and I think Germany and Minister Habeck and Minister Baerbock are working tirelessly to end our dependency on Russian fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas as quickly as possible. And uh, I recognize that that is not necessarily fast enough, uh, but I can assure you that we're trying to do everything that we can to both make that happen, and I'll come to the question of trade-offs and choices in this incredibly uh, moral, morally uh, <laughs> just significant moment, um, but also then to, in this moment, to scale up um, what we can and how fast we can in the energy efficiency, in the reducing our dependency, right, as a whole, and scaling up the renewable energy. And I think both Germany and certainly the European Union and other countries are looking. I had some conversations with colleagues today with other member states who are just moving as fast as they possibly can, and I call on all of us uh, to do that uh, in that context. I think um, the choices that we have um, and Minister Habeck's um, uh, work uh, tireless work to find those other sources, I think links in also with uh, a point that, that you were making, um, which is, okay, we need to remove that uh, dependency on Russian oil and gas as fast as possible, but we also have to ensure that we're not locking in long-term fossil fuel infrastructure from other countries um, that will then make the 1.5 degree climate goal completely impossible to meet. And this is, I think, we'll show ourselves in the coming months uh, how resolve, it's like a moment of truth, I think, for all of us. Uh, so therefore, the, the conversations that Minister Habeck has about how to make things uh, green hydrogen uh, ready, uh, and also to make sure that contracts are not these very long contracts, but 
I'm not aware of all the details of these contracts, but his statements were quite clear also with the United States that, that the uh, new agreement there with the European Union uh, should not be um, increasing emissions further. We know that fracking obviously is not uh, a climate uh, appropriate technology, but how to do that in a way that uh, drives us down. And then finally, I, I just think to say that no matter what we have to do in this time, in this period of time to, re to reduce uh, and to end, rather, that dependency um, uh, is, is also to see that we keep our, our goals in place in Germany and in the European Union to phase out coal and fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Minister Cingolani, same question uh, basically yep. to you, your priorities and also the trade-offs well, in this connection. Of course, we share a similar situation with Germany. We are a very intensive manufacturing countries and we uh, we import a lot of gas from Russia, about 40%. It's a 29 billion cubic meter every year. Um, so we are rushing in getting independent. Um, we have five gas pipelines connecting the country. Three are uh, along the southern and eastern uh, routes, and uh, so we're going to differentiate very soon. We're increasing the number of regasificators. Uh, two are coming. So the target is to be very fast in replacing those 29 billion cubic meters. But I want to make clear a point. I mean, this is just replacing that amount of gas, and eventually. Uh, reducing that amount of gas. But there are other strategies that in parallel should be deployed. Uh, first of all, um, a mature approach to energy saving. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind to, 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 the, to the audience here that uh, every um, 10 kilowatt hour we save in energy, we save one cubic meter of gas. So just make the calculations very easy. Um, we are investing a lot in circularity. It's a very effective way to produce energy. I mean, Italy is, is, has a long-standing tradition in transformational chemistry. We produce uh, approximately 30, 30 million tons of waste every, every year, and a large part of that can be transformed into energy or compost, reducing uh, nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, these are all contributions towards the reduction of the need of gas on one hand, towards the reduction of the de dependence of another country on the import on the other hand, and also show the way towards a sustainable, a sustainable uh, energy transition. Having said this, um, I would like to add something. I mean, no one here has mentioned the real problem, which is market speculation. And uh, now the war, of course, is very emotional, and uh, uh, we are all extremely sorry for what's happening. Uh, and this is really terrible in, in, in the year 2022. But in this moment, in our pipeline, European pipeline, the amount of gas that is flowing is exactly identical to the one that was flowing one year ago at this time. Okay, we're not lacking, we're not missing gas. The quantity is the same. So, can anybody explain me why one year ago we were paying 25 cents per cubic meter and today we're paying 1.5 euro per cubic meter? If I have to store my gas in my storage, I need 15 billions now. One year ago it was 2 billions. So, of course, there is a free market. I understand. But the market cannot be free on the shoulder of citizens and companies. Mm -hmm. Now, there were people who were beating on the fact that the gas would have been reducing in price according to the forward. They were promising a sale of large amounts of gas at a given price. And then there was an unexpected event that we call the war. And now they are struggling finding the gas that they don't produce. So this is something we guys, all of us, we have to change. And this has nothing to do with the war because the war is, terif is terrible, but also uh, market speculation is terrible. And I would like to hear something about that. Yeah, a major discussion, of course, in Brussels uh, at the moment about how possibly to address that. Let me go back to uh, the Under Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Grzegorzej Czetwertynski. And Poland said over this past weekend that it will be the first EU member country to completely forego Russian oil, coal, and gas. Surveys of your population, uh, Mr. Undersecretary of State, show that a majority of Poles absolutely would support a full EU-wide embargo on Russian fossil fuels. Some other EU member states, including Germany so far, Hungary, 
say that is not possible. They rule out such action, citing the risk of recession. What's your response to that? Well, I think it, it was said already uh, and earlier by, by Yaroslav, but it, it, even though it may seems to be it may seem to be something difficult to do currently, I think the 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 difficulty is is nothing in comparison with uh, avoiding uh, a war. I, I I believe that maybe you know being uh, closer uh, to the war in in, in Poland. Um, Seeing on our streets the the, the numbers of uh, refugees and and the, the drama of these situations, and uh, and talking to, to 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 them, maybe we 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 feel that really this war is 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 really a real threat, and maybe you don't realize that that well when you're further away. But I do believe that um, that if we want to avoid uh, uh, this uh, this uh, third world war, as mentioned by by Yaroslav, we really need uh, to be doing more. And the cost of of these uh, further action is nothing in comparison uh, with what we can what we can avoid. I think the current situation has also clearly shown that you know relying on on one technology and one supplier for our transition has uh, has been a, a very huge risk. And unfortunately, that that risk has uh, materialized now. And we should really think, when we rethink our strategy, how to diversify our supplies, how to diversify also the technologies that we use to produce energy in order not to be so dependent uh, on a single technology and a single supplier. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, take a, a deeper dive on this and also on the question of energy savings. All of you have mentioned that point. Uh, the IEA says that turning down the thermostat just one degree centigrade would cut consumption by 10 billion cubic meters of natural gas over a year. That's a month's worth of Russian imports. We're talking about here EU-wide. Um, speed limits, partial restrictions on car use of the type that we saw in the 1970s after the oil shocks, other measures would boost all of that, leading The Economist this week to conclude, I'm quoting, that Europe is asking too little of citizens. Would you agree with that, Deputy Minister Demchenko? Uh, yeah, just only a few remarks. Uh, uh, regarding previous uh, speakers, messages, colleagues. Crisis and opportunity are the two faces of the same coin. And while for now we see more of a crisis side, still we believe that this hope I share with all Ukrainian the opportunities right around the corner. The opportunity to build back safer, greener, and more resilient society and economies based on the principle of energy efficiency, climate neutrality. With the Green Deal, the European Union has committed to a complete overhaul of energy policy and the way of life. That's why when we are talking about future and current situation, we first of all thinking about uh, how we could save more energy, how we could destroy this dependence. Because for Russia, this is very uh, significant amount of budget. 33% of their budget came uh, from, from uh, uh, selling all export of Russian oil and gas. And this is uh, very important for us, thinking about future, Re, re, uh, limit our cooperation with Russian energy companies. And uh, re, regarding, uh, regarding uh, uh, this issue, Ukraine is paying a high price for its independence and future. And this is not just only for our independence and future, but also for European countries. And as Adam has mentioned, uh, we see understanding of all, all countries of this situation. That's why our contribution should be uh, very significant and very, as, as you have mentioned, we should do this immediately because we don't have time for waiting. Jennifer? 
asking more of citizens. I don't know about you, I'm old enough to remember Jimmy Carter sitting there in a thick sweater telling everybody to turn their thermostats down. Yeah, I think that um, maybe two parts of this. I think that clearly there is still massive uh, opportunities, whether it be through the circular economy, whether it be through energy savings, and I think um, we're seeing that from a government perspective in the package that's moving forward from Germany and the EU of how to accelerate that and double down on those energy savings so that they can happen as quickly as possible for all the reasons that we know. Um, I think that, indeed, I think if, um, if people want to know how they can help reduce Putin's power, <laughs> and influence, uh, then indeed thinking about what each person across Europe can be doing to um, reduce that demand that comes with a very high price. And uh, there I think that I know and have many conversations with, with people about how they each are making that choice. And I think, you know, we, we live in, in Europe in a, in a situation where one can take those measures and uh, do so in a way that um, certainly in comparison to what is happening in Ukraine uh, is just a, a, small, a small way forward, a small way of showing that, that solidarity. So I would call on people to think about that, to move forward, to know that you reduce Putin's power when you take your own action, uh, and that every bit of that matters. Thank you very much. And Minister Cingolani, same question to you. And of yeah. course, this doesn't mean should we pass on those speculative inflated prices directly to citizens. That's not the point, sure. but what, what citizens and, and, uh, and those who are concerned can actually do in the area of energy efficiency right now. Yeah, uh, I believe there's a, a twofold approach. One is the states should um, help uh, energy saving, for instance, by reducing or improving uh, energy management in the residential housings or traffic limitations, uh, citizens, and, and also, sorry, and also uh, supporting programs for public awareness. I mean, this is something people, you, we, we, cannot, we cannot impose by law energy saving, or at least we can partially impose by law the energy saving. This is a problem of dissemination, education, public awareness. We need to invest in the young people. And saving is not only reducing the, the, thermost, the thermostatic uh, control of the house or the heating of the house, <coughs> or reducing the speed of the cars. Saving is also uh, properly managing food. We are wasting a huge amount of food about, I mean, I read in a, in a UN report that uh, with the food we waste in the so-called rich countries, we could feed three times as much the vulnerable countries having no food. I mean, the, 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 we should think about that. Are we ready um, to operate on the end of life pipeline of, of, of all our goods to save materials, to recycle? Are we ready to produce cars that are speed and acceleration limited? I mean, I've been living in Germany for many years, and I'm Italian, so I like to drive. <laughs> uh, why, why we build cars, even with the internal combustion engine, that are limited in speed at 250 kilometers per hour, when the speed limits are univocally set everywhere at 120, 130? Come on. Uh, we, we should start thinking. Uh, it, it's even a problem of marketing sometime, sometimes. So this is a, a cultural revolution. We cannot, do, we cannot impose this revolution simply by a law. We have to invest in the new generations, I think. Thank you very much. Um, let me come back to you, Deputy Minister Demchenko, if I may, and ask you about, in a way, the obverse side of what we're discussing. Uh, you've made it very clear that Putin is seeking to keep everybody hooked on natural gas. He's also doing everything he can to make sure that that gas can keep on flowing. There has been some concern expressed, uh, certainly here in Germany, but uh, I, also beyond it, about what would happen if, in fact, Russian fossil fuels were to be cut off from one day to the next uh, by the demand side, not by the Russians themselves, whether that could in fact lead a more isolated President Putin facing extreme economic decline in his country to become more aggressive rather than less? Um, 
It is difficult to uh, predict and uh, think about his act actions because uh, his he demonstrated that uh, he's uh, real criminal war, and this is quite 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 difficult to provide any um, forecast to do any forecast and planning regarding possible actions for, from Russia. But we can do everything. To stop, uh, to stop Russia, and to be ready to live without Russian energy, energy. And first of all, we should, uh, we should countries, our country should uh, give up on their decarbonization goals. And I believe that we should work together to uh, achieve energy independence. And this is very important for us at this stage because, as you have mentioned. We understand that our countries uh, were very dependent on Russia, uh, gas, and other fossil fuels. And we should immediately conduct integration of our energy market. Freedom is really, freedom market is really a good option and important option. But we should demonstrate solidarity when we implement in European rules, for example, third energy package. We, uh, a half year ago, told that Nord Stream 2, this is a Russian energy weapon, and this project should be conducted according with third energy package. And we told everybody that when Putin stopped this project, Nord Stream 2, he will start invention, and he did it. Unfortunately, our countries were not ready for this. And uh, not to have such problems in future, we should think about diversifications of our energy sources uh, and uh, reduce dependence on the predatory Russian energy resources. Last month demonstrate Europe's ability to unite in uh, concreting aggression, aggression of Russia, and we hope at the same we will true in the energy sector. And uh, during months of this uh, full-scale war, for example, our energy system showed its resilience. It is quite difficult because at the first beginning, uh, first day before the war, we uh, disconnected from Russia and Belarus electricity grid, and uh, during two weeks uh, operated in island mode, just only uh, using our sources, our uh, balancing system. And also, this is important that uh, during bombing and uh, destruction of critical energy infrastructure, we also demonstrate resilience. Frequency of our energy grids 50 gigahertz, and this is uh, incredible. Uh, this is really uh, demonstrate how our energy is uh, stable, and uh, of course uh, this is very big uh, challenge for us and threat this uh, nuclear terrorism, and we should find uh, proper solution and uh, stop these activities, demilitarize our nuclear facilities, and deoccupy the, these nuclear facilities. And uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, this is that. Uh, international uh, society uh, should understand uh, that uh, this is not a game, this is not a movie, this is real life, this is real war, this is real death, and our actions against of this should be also real. And uh, this is uh, not just only for business, this is for, for governments. Governments should do immediately, and we really thank uh, your government from German and uh, Poland and uh, Italy that you provide real support, and we hope in future we will have even more, because this is our joint uh, war, and we should do this joint effort, I think. 
Jennifer, if I can just come back to something you said a moment ago. You talked about this moment of moral clarity that we face. And it strikes me that when we talk about sanctions, whether it would be a potential embargo on Russian fossil fuel imports or the sanctions that have already been put into place that are clearly the toughest uh, that uh, certainly the EU has ever imposed, whether... We do that not only to get a particular behavior in the short term, which of course often doesn't happen right away, but also simply to reinforce our own moral standards, our, our norms. And if that's the case, um, are all of the arguments that are made about why we shouldn't do an embargo, because it could cause more harm to us than to Russia, or maybe it would push Putin in a different direction, do they become less relevant when we look at it that way? I think the moral choices that are having to be made today are just incredibly difficult. Um, I think I think the the commitment to go as fast as possible in weighing those different choices, which how do you weigh those things? I mean, um, you know, are happening in in real time, thinking about the reality of what's happening on the ground in the Ukraine, the reality of here, the the dynamics of the of the power games that are going on as well. And I think within that, you know, um, people are doing the best that they can to try and find that compass in a way forward. Um, and to do things as quickly as possible to, to end that dependence, but also to recognize um, those those other choices that are there. So, um, and as I said, I don't I, I know that's not a satisfactory answer. Um, I think it's an example of how in the world today, the moral choices that are made, particularly in a values-based foreign policy, which we are working hard here to move forward. Are um, are incredibly challenging, and uh, and the moral choices of a, a wartime, the moral choices of uh, what we're all doing to phase out fossil fuels as a whole. For the we haven't talked too much also about just the the ravage of the climate emergency that is happening around the world. We have to do all of this at the same time. We have to do all of it at the same time, and that is uh, just a tremendous uh, momentous. Absolutely. Challenge. I was recently present at the United Nations FCCC uh, for discussions, internal discussions, at which they said after the pandemic, we thought we would be returning to climate change absolutely in the spotlight. And in fact, uh, what we're seeing is that once again, uh, one crisis sort of puts shoves to the side, or at least uh, there's potential for these two crises, obviously, to be mutually productively reinforcing. Um, nonetheless, uh, it's it's a lot of crisis uh, to be handled. Uh, I wanted to ask whether we should briefly move on to what was supposed to be another central focus of this uh, panel. Uh, for evident reasons, we have not uh, given it much time. But essentially, the geopolitics of where we're going. We've been talking a lot about the geopolitics of where we are but maybe just a brief perspective from each of you on the shift to clean energy and the geopolitical risks that could be entailed there. Because, of course, a lot of the crucial inputs for wind, solar, green hydrogen are also concentrated in particular geographical reason, regions that are not necessarily a great deal more politically reliable or well-governed than fossil fuel producers. So how do you see that trade-off? Is that something that concerns you? And what can we learn going forward? Yeah, uh, I admit I'm very concerned because um, there are a couple of... Uh, important problems that we should uh, somehow face. On one hand, there is about 3 billion people in the planet. By the way, most of those are living in countries where there is a lot of sun, uh, who have no good access to energy, sometimes no access to water, and you know, there is a, a gray scale, but uh, um, I don't think we can conceive a, 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 an ecological, a global ecological transition or, or a global energy transformation just by neglecting those 3 billion people. 
Uh, and, and this is what is happening now. Uh, so I think global inequalities should be treated exactly at the same level or even with some priority uh, as the uh, climate emergency. The second thing is that we were ambitiously accelerating on the 1.5 uh, uh, degrees. Just in the COP26, this happened a few months ago. China was uh, uh, accepting the challenge, and this means that uh, over the next few years, uh, the, the need of China of liquid, uh, liquid gas will increase from the actual 300 and, and something billions to maybe twice that much, about 600 billion cubic meters, uh, because they, they, they're going to replace their, their coal-based uh, primary energy production. So this is commendable on one hand. On the other hand, it's going to unbalance completely the liquid gas market. So we want, of course, China to give the contribution, and we're all happy with that, but then we need to produce an incredible amount of liquid, uh, liquid gas. Um, so this will, will make things more complicated. So the, the, the main geopolitical scenario is that we have to take care of uh, a large part of the planet population uh, that is really in the need of energy, water, uh, agriculture, food. On the other hand, we have a massive change in the energy landscape of the advanced countries, and we have to face those things. And once again, I don't think we can do this only with the renewable energy. So maybe we should, we should seriously consider for the next three, four decades, where, where are we going to, what are we going to do? And uh, I can say here, and I said in public already, I think we should accelerate in research and development in uh, nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. I said clearly fusion. I didn't say fission. I said fusion. <laughs> I might even consider for a transitory period that uh, small modular reactors could be used in specific uh, energy-intensive districts, like uh, like in the uh, in the ice-breaking ships. But but this is just a, 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 a small portion of the need for the future. We have to think to something stable long-living, safe, programmable, uh, global energy, energy source. And uh, I think nature gives the, give the lesson, and stars are obviously uh, the best way to, to produce energy. So humanity should make an effort in this direction and should make the effort now. So now this is the time to invest for that. Otherwise, in 20 years, we'll be here discussing more and more the same problems and possibly with a with worse environmental situation. Thank you very much. Let me go to Under Secretary of State Grzegorzej uh, Czepaktinski for a perspective on the same issue, the shifting geopolitics of energy and uh, the risks uh, that we may see in the future. Well, I mentioned that in, in my first uh, comments, actually, that, that we are seeing indeed new risk associated with the new technologies that we are using. I think um, one th element that uh, we've seen in the past already, if we think, for instance, of um, the evolutions we've seen in terms of technologies that we use to produce batteries, we, we, we have seen that the, the, um, the metals we need for these batteries have evolved in the past. And I'm pretty sure that the technologies will also evolve in the, in the future. So that um, reliance on specific um, uh, materials is, uh, is evolving as we will develop new technologies and as we also will develop uh, ways of recycling. Uh, and there, Jennifer mentioned the, the importance of the circular economy in our transition. It is indeed something that is, uh, that is important. But I do, I do believe as well that your, your question is very right. I mean, in the sense that if our strategy with uh, developing, for instance, hydrogen risks creating uh, a new dependency, then we should probably think twice of how do we implement it. We, because we need uh, um, a strategy, we need a technology um, that will um, reinforce uh, our um, autonomy, our uh, uh, independence as, uh, as Europe, and we need to, um, to invest in the, uh, European, uh, in the European economy uh, to provide the, the technologies that we need uh, uh, for the future. If our uh, strategy is just providing new uh, uh, revenue streams for some kleptocrats around the world, then we should probably rethink what we are doing. Mm -hmm. In fact, The Economist, in the same article I mentioned earlier, talks about a shift from petro-states to electro-states and their autocrats. Um, 
let me ask all of you, we have very little time left on our clock, but just the briefest of final words from each of you. And as I was preparing this panel, I found myself wondering the following, and I'm going to pass it on to you as a question. Is energy independence an illusion, even if we do accelerate the energy transition? Um, is it illusory to think we can be independent when it comes to energy? Vice Minister Demchenkov? Believe me, five weeks Ukraine has been fighting an uphill battle against the Russian army, and we still believe and even more believe that energy independence is the main option for our future. And for five weeks, with your support, support of your countries, Ukraine is holding Putin back and making him weaker. And energy sector, especially oil and gas and nuclear energy, are pressure point for the corrupt economy and Putin's regime that has spread for far beyond Russia. And the price of delay and hedging about the step, this is price of our energy independence and the price of our energy security in whole region. And that's why we should think about future. We should build our future based on climate neutral technologies. We should think also find real place of nu uh, nuclear generation in, in, in this future, because this is a significant amount uh, uh, of uh, energy, uh, energy production. And uh, we believe that we have good future and we will build it uh, together and green, uh, green future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Jennifer Morgan. I mean, I don't know what else to say besides what, what you just said. I think that um, an illusion is to think that we can continue the way that we are going. Uh, an illusion is to think that a dependency on, uh, on, on Russian fossil fuels or other fossil fuels is going to bring us any kind of stability and peace uh, from climate disruption, from war, uh, from energy disruption. So I think we have no choice. We have to move forward. This is the way that we have to go. Uh, with determination, uh, with compassion, with ambition. We have to be smart, we have to be strategic, and, and, and move forward with that uh, front and center. Thank you very much. Well, I think in a, in a very interconnected world, uh, being completely autonomous is, is impossible. But of, sure, of course, you, you can have a reasonable independence. There is a big difference between being dependent on a country or being partially dependent on a country. I think what well, we should have a, a reasonable uh, trade-off. Uh, what we're doing now is, is, is quite reasonable. Thank you very much. Under Secretary of State uh, Guy Boger uh, Chetavinsky. Sorry. <laughs> yes, well, I, I, do, I do agree that it's, it's definitely an illusion to think that there is uh, uh, something without risk. There are always uh, some risks. If the current situation has to teach us something about the way we are planning our uh, transformation, then we should really think about the importance of diversification, diversification of supplies, but also diversification of the technologies that we use to produce energy. Because as Minister Cingolini just said, if, if we are not uh, too much reliant on one single solution, then there is the, this possibility that the, 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 the risks will, uh, uh, will not be overthrowing us uh, on, on this path. Thank you very much. And it's always been a central premise of the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue that the Energiewende is not a national undertaking, it's a global one. That's certainly something that we heard from Foreign Minister Baerbock this morning. And in that sense, that cooperation is clearly, and this is what I'm hearing from all of you, one key way to reduce risk. So with that, let me just return briefly to our Slido poll to take a quick look at the audience's answer. So in the end, 84% say that the energy transition will make the world safer. 12% say the effects will cancel each other out, that we'll see new risks that essentially balance out the gains. And 4%, 
just 4% say that the energy transition will make the world less safe. So I'd say that's quite an overwhelming majority. Thank you, dear audience, for voting. And warm thanks to all of our panelists for being with us here today, with a special thanks uh, to Yaroslav Demchenkov for making the trip uh, to join us in person. Thank you so much. Thank you.